Good afternoon and welcome to the Inclusive Spaces Seminar Series at the Bartman, the Faculty of the Built Environment here at UCL. Um, today you have joined us for the May edition of Inclusive Spaces, uh, where the focus will be on mental health and social justice in the urban outdoors. I'm Axel Mutanda. I'm a lecturer in environmental and spatial equity at the Butler School of Architecture, as well as the co-director for equality, diversity and inclusion. And I will be hosting this session. Inclusive Sessions is our monthly seminar led by the Bartlett Equity, Diversity and Inclusion uh, group, where we are showcasing the latest research and ideas on all dimensions of diversity in the built environment. So before we begin, um, I would just like to start with a little housekeeping. This session will be recorded and added to the Bartlett's uh, YouTube channel, um, the Bartlett's EDI website, and forwarded to registered attendees. Um, so the format for today uh, will begin with an introduction of our guests um, who will present uh, for the first half hour of the session. And this will be followed by Q&A before ending promptly at 2 p.m. We really do encourage you to submit a question for the speakers at any point during the lecture by clicking on the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. And you can submit your own questions or upvote other questions. So, today it is my pleasure to welcome uh, my colleague from the Bartlett Developmental Planning Unit, DPU, uh, Lisa Griffin, who is a lecturer in environmental politics, and her collaborator, Kate Loris, a strategic environmental planner and director of Mapping Futures. They will present to us their research on the crucial role urban green spaces can play for people's mental health. And we will discuss how we can address intersectional, gendered, and racialized barriers and challenges relating to uh, disabilities that prohibit park user engagement with the urban outdoors. So um, handing over to our speaker. Thanks very much, Maxwell. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Is that working okay? Perfect. Brilliant, thank you. Right, um, thanks so much for this invitation. It's really exciting to be talking about our emerging work. Um, we only recently concluded the, the empirical um, data gathering. So we're working our way through the analysis and we've picked out some, some key conclusions uh, to talk about with you this afternoon. There's a lot more to say, and it's a really nuanced debate, but we hope by talking about these, these key things, we can give you a flavor of, of some of the work that we're developing. So our, our research um, looked at the, um, the ways in which park users in North and South London derived and experienced well-being in green spaces during the, the recent pandemic and our research covered lockdown periods from 2020 to 2021. So we were paying attention to the, the emergent social and spatial factors which mediated and shaped um, the different ways and the extent to which people experienced and, and felt well-being. So although we were concerned with mental health, we, we framed our work within um, a sort of uh, well-being um, conception. And definitions of well-being are, you know, as, as we all know, very complicated and definitions of them abound. Most literatures consider well-being to be to do with a, a state of being. So that's either a description of someone's quality of life or an account of how they feel that they can cope with everyday living. So this means, therefore, that the determinants of well-being, the things that uh, go to, to make it up and, and to um, mediate our experience with it are understood to be either internal or external. So, for example, the, um, the external determinants of well-being are often concerned with things like our living conditions, uh, levels of education, our relationships to other people, and the internal determinants of well-being are often to do with the things that go on in our head, our preferences, our ambitions, our attitudes and so on. 
And we clearly don't have scope here to outline the very many debates in wellbeing thinking. But I think it's worth pointing to the useful distinction that often comes up in the literature between eudaimonic and hedonic versions of well-being. And these, these different um, binary notions of well-being still very much characterise the field. For Forgerd and others, well um, feeling good relates to notions of hedonic well-being, while doing and living well are often closer to notions of eudaimonic um, characteristics of well-being. Sarah White, a, a sort of key thinker in this field that we drew on centrally in our work, she's a professor of development studies, criticizes this dominant cultural complex that divides our human lives into these different domains. And, and this, she thinks, restricts the analysis of well-being to individuals at the cost of reflecting on broader power structures. So by focusing on individuals' um, own self-responsibility, these discourses of well-being frequently move the discussion away from what we might call these structural determinants about how people uh, live well. However, in centering these external relations and making them, you know, the key to our analysis, there's a tendency to misrecognize the very personal experiences of well-being that are also central to how people um, relate to the world and, and how they feel. But for this reason, and, and because of this difficult dichotomy, we, we've taken an approach to well-being designed to transcend this dichotomy. And our own relational perspective that Kay will elaborate on a bit later is attentive to the intersecting mental, emotional, environmental and contextual factors that together in an intersecting way amount to our experiences of well-being. We think that this relational perspective invites us to understand how well-being behaviours and our experiences of it manifest within wider social relationships, which we obviously think are crucial. So as well as being central to academic debates on development, well-being is, of course, a really key idea um, for urban health and uh, urban mental health. And if we look at definitions of um, well-being, oh, sorry, of health, they often refer back to well-being and, and vice versa. So these, these two notions of living well and being healthful are intimately related. So if you take the um, World Health Organization's recent definition of mental health, they say that it concerns a state of well-being where an individual realizes her or his abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. Mental health, therefore, is fundamental to our collective and our individual ability as humans to think, emote, interact with each other, earn a living and enjoy life. So these things are incredible, inc incredibly central to, to everything that we do and everything that we are. Um, our rationale for situating this work in London, despite being a member of the Development Studies uh, Unit, which uh, does research all, all over the world, is this long established link between mental health and the city. Urban living is considered to be a, a risk factor for depression, anxiety, and it's said to double the risk of living with schizophrenia. So despite this acknowledgement and this long association, policymakers have only very recently been paying attention to the ways that urban life impacts upon our mental health. So our London-based research then was, was focused upon periods of lockdown, when one of the very few healthful activities that we could legally engage in um, was exercise in an outdoor space. So if you recall, government messaging encouraged us to leave home for up to an hour a day, um, only for the purposes of exercise, not for socialising, but just for going out and getting moving. And of course, that changed over the course of the pandemic. Urban green spaces then became a really vital resource, particularly those people living in London with no outdoor space and no access to a garden. We took another um, starting point we took as another starting point some of the recent literature on disaster and quarantine related mental health research. 
And this demonstrates that long periods of isolation can have really detrimental impacts on our mental health and well-being. And recent studies that are currently uh, being published have also evidenced an increased prevalence and worsening of mental health disorders like depression and anxiety. It was clear and, and emerging research is telling us that these um, were experienced most profoundly by mi minorities and disadvantaged groups. So the, we drew upon the social determinants of health uh, concept, which tells us that ethnicity, gender, disability, and socioeconomic position are categories that help to shape and predict the distribution of ill health within society. Like structural disadvantage, um, experiences of stigma and racism also contribute to health inequalities in cities. So for example, experiencing racism, prejudice and discrimination is highly stressful and has a negative, a documented negative effect on mental and overall health. We draw on post-colonial thinker Jennifer Nash and arguing that these kinds of discriminations and sexist and racist oppressions invince themselves in diverse ways and in different contexts. And the context that we explored uh, most obviously was of course green parks and green spaces. So drawing on Nash's work, we attempted to be more, um, attuned to the subtle manifestations of these kinds of oppressions. And we designed a narrative-based uh, research method, which Kay will discuss in a bit more detail, to illuminate some of these subtleties. So we focus therefore on the, on the lived experiences of disadvantaged and, and minoritized people. And of course, these were communities and individuals who'd already been disproportionately impacted um, by the pandemic and by pandemic measures. And of course, given the, the effects of the pandemic on overall mental health and the reputed um, benefits of green spaces for improving health, it was clearly important to pay attention to this, this complex relationship. So we looked at the relationship between pandemic responses, green space use and resulting well-being benefits. So as well as being one of the few places that people could exercise and seek solace during periods of lockdown, green spaces have long been associated um, and valued for their wider contributions to public health. And there's a burgeoning amount of literature on, on, this, on this topic, as, as Kay will attest, and, and, and we've been reading it and anal analysing it recently. Um, and you know, there, there's been, you know, qualitative research, in-depth narrative-based research like ours, and some more quantitative research that's, that highlights some quite important relationships. So, for example, regular use of an open space or a park or a forested area is associated with about a 43% lower risk of poor general health. And with each additional use of any natural environment per week, you apparently um, get a 6% lower risk of poor mental health. Regular use of natural environments for physical activities can cut the risk of suffering poor mental health by around half. So these are quite staggering figures. So clearly um, green space access and green space use is an important tool and, and urban um, space for ameliorating some of these um, poor health outcomes. Several more recent studies have examined how experiences of nature help people to cope with lockdown measures. And of course, many of us bought more pot plants and um, in, enjoyed green things. But re emerging research in this area suggests that the existence of even having you know, some, a green vista from our window was associated with better self-esteem, um, more subjective happiness, and decreased levels of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. So these, these are quite startling um, bits of research. Much literature highlights the associations between green spaces and well-being, but very little of it manage, um, examines the actual pathways beyond noticing that green spaces can facilitate social interaction and physical activity, both of which are important for our overall health. But of course, these, these things are not unique to green spaces. 
So our research tried to address the this sort of this gap, if you like, to examine these these new, more nuanced pathways. And we tried to examine the multiple ways through which people experienced well-being during their green space visits. We explored the factors that helped to facilitate its fulfillment and the limits to different people's experience of it. We drew upon the growing research that's explored factors which inhibit people's experience of and access to outdoor environments. And there is a growing amount of work dedicated to exploring the important um, area of green space injustice. Several recent reports by organisations working in this field um, have, that have been published just in the last couple of years have highlighted how people living, um, people from minoritised or disadvantaged backgrounds are much more likely to live in areas of the city with a deficiency of access to green space. Fields in the trust, in trust, for example, reported that there are over two and a half million people in Britain without access to green space within a short walk. And evidence clearly shows that um, green space use and enjoyment and proximity clearly disproportionately uh, benefits white, able-bodied and more affluent communities. However, it's really important to note that proximity is not the only factor in determining equitable access. So we tried to pay attention to the, to the other spatial dynamics. What became clear for us in our own study is that even when green spaces were close by, positive green space experiences were not realised by everyone to the same degree. Researchers know very little about how multifaceted and dynamic processes contribute to reinforcing these kinds of inequalities, and that's some of the things that we wanted to explore. So we, we've tried to pay attention to the, to the complex um, interplay of factors that work to shape differential personal and community experiences of well-being. I'm now going to pass over to Kay, who's going to tell you a little bit about, about our research design. Thanks, Lisa. So um, as Lisa sort of mentioned, we um, were already sort of exposed by the media um, how people were benefiting from green spaces during this time. Um, and so um, we came up with uh, five key research questions to help us sort of um, unpack some of the um, key issues that were emerging. So our first question was, who used green spaces um, during the COVID-19 lockdowns and how were they used? Um, and this was trying to expand on these um, really typical images that we did start to see in the media of packed parks, um, increased use, and especially during that first summer in 2020 when the weather was much finer. Um, and of course, these findings started to emerge in the literature too, um, uh, but less was um, being said on these pathways and mechanisms in which people were experiencing well-being. Therefore, our next question really tried to focus on trying to elicit thoughts and feelings and memories and emotions interpretations that were evolved and expressed towards people's sort of uh, personal experience and relationship to those green spaces. So the question on what ways and to what extent did users derive well-being from green spaces? The third key question, um, the motivation around that was really, um, as Lisa said, sort of a number of key national reviews also started to emerge around how access was not equal. Therefore, another fundamental question was very much around trying to understand what threats and exclusions were experienced by users and how these manifested. Um, and finally, um, in exploring the literature on relational dynamics and all these very complicated interrelated sort of influencing people's use and experience of green spaces was key to understand further. So uh, wider questions were also being asked to see whether we can identify anything in relation to the wider situated issues or outside factors that were impacting people's choices and decisions and ac actions and behaviours to the green spaces that they connected to. So what relational well-being factors motivated people's use or non-use of green spaces was another key question. Of course, we didn't ask it in, in a direct way um, like that, but we were trying to um, elicit how people were experiencing the pandemic generally and their sort of general connections to um, the, the spaces themselves, etc. And finally, um, the last question wasn't a question we set out 
to address fundamentally initially, but um, in speaking to the friends user groups, um, we wanted to then understand the role of friends groups and the community green space advocates in shaping people's use and experiences of green spaces. So these form the fundamental sort of overarching um, questions. Next slide, Lisa. Um, and we reviewed the literature on, relation, on the relational approach to well-being and started to sort of pick out some of, and highlight some of the complex dynamics um, at play. And the relational lens really allowed us to look at factors like personal agency, so things like our personal reference points, our personal intra relationships with ourselves, um, and the relationships of ourselves to place, of ourselves to others within place, um, et cetera. So um, a, there's a, a sort of rich body of literature um, that sort of starts to um, sort of unpack the relational lens. And we felt um, we were mindful to this and we wanted to therefore sort of choose an in-depth interview approach um, up to an hour long to give us that, per that personal narrative of people's experiences to sort of explore this complexity. So we undertook interviews, they took place online often, uh, but in some cases they also took place in situ in the parks themselves. Um, another key thing to our research design was that we consulted um, an expert panel of researchers with experience in conducting wellbeing research and or sort of research on social exclusion and minoritized communities to sensitize us to some of the ethics in the kind of research, in this kind of research and to help us shape our research design. So that was really key. Um, obviously notice, um, sort of knowing our, noticing our sort of our own position in that space. Um, the interview questions were designed to either sort of directly answer the research questions, such as how did you use the park during lockdown and did your use change? And in other instances, it was indirect um, to ameliorate problems such as respondents simply reporting um, expected tropes and well-being. Um, so we asked green space users to really um, let us know about their feelings, their experiences and their motivations for visiting. Um, next slide. Um, another thing that we were um, mindful of was the different types of green spaces. So we began by choosing three parks in North London and Camden and three parks in Lewisham um, because we wanted to look at a range of sizes and functions. Um, in reality, however, when people spoke to us about their experiences in green space, they never really just spoke about the space that we sort of um, um, that, that we sort of um, engaged with them through. It was all independent, and um, they were all talking about very different spaces um, and visiting different spaces during this time. But this was a starting point, and we were sort of linked by the local authority to friends groups. So these are groups um, which. Um, informally manage uh, community, uh, sorry, informally manage the, the parks through volunteer days. Um, and the friends groups are key stakeholders because their involvement in caring for the green space, often in, informal, but um, doing this role allows them to really notice and know their space well, um, and often know things that the local authority isn't mindful to. So for this reason, we felt that they were an important stakeholder group to kick off our interviews and ask um, questions to, for them to reflect on their observations of their park use, or of, of the park use of their users. Um, and of course, the questions were worded slightly differently. Um, the friends groups then um, linked us to um, users that they, they knew or um, who, who they were connected to. So this tended to be active volunteers who were also helping out in green spaces. Um, and finally, the final um, user group were the, just the general users. So these are users who use green spaces for their own personal use and enjoyment. And we approached people in various ways. So we visited parks and tried to um, engage with them that way. That wasn't as successful because we found that people tended not to want to engage in the moment, often being there for their own quiet reflection and for their own purposes and didn't want to engage. Um, another way was we, we joined two summer park events and this allowed us to recruit um, some further interviews. That made it slightly easier to approach people because they were out there sort of enjoying that's the social aspects of it. This was in the summer of 2021 when um, obviously um, events were allowed by that point. 
Um, and finally, um, through community garden mailing lists, so inviting users for an interview via um, mailing lists that the, um, some of the green spaces were connected to. It's important to know that we recruited respondents um, through this snowballing effect, and we did not set out to target specific social groups um, and instead allowed respondents to self-identify. Therefore, we by no means have a representative sample of different groups. Um, it's also important to note that we interviewed sort of green space users who were obviously using the park and therefore were not able to explore fully the factors that kept people away. Um, in total, we interviewed 18 stakeholder groups, seven of which were formal parks, friends groups, six were community gardens, so more led by the community, um, two other green space initiative groups who set up sort of initiatives in green spaces at the time, um, and three national organizations who actively work within the research and green space policy arena. And we interviewed just over 30 green space users too. So um, next slide please, Lisa. Um, as already mentioned, um, sort of this relational lens was really important as a framework. Um, to begin, we uh, sort of transcribed all the scripts we, and used thematic analysis as the main approach to try and categorize people's sentiments, their meanings, their feelings that they were sort of mentioning. Um, and the transcripts were reviewed and coded um, and hi to highlight all the themes in line with the research questions and also with repeated sentiments. So there was like a two, a two scale sort of a coding approach. And the third one was really using this relational um, well-being framework, which is represented here by White's diagram of interlocking loops, and it captures the three well-being dimensions of personal, um, that's our sort of personal relationship with ourselves and with others, the social, uh, social relationships, and then the environment and the relationship to space. So these three sort of interlocking um, well-being dynamics also formed an important lens through which how we understood well-being and how it's constituted and derived and how exclusions and on uh, sort of unequal well-being impacts manifest and therefore forms another sort of categorization layer if you like and allowed us to appreciate how actually relational thinking has a role in green space and well-being conceptualization um, in reality what we found was that the relational approach of course is very complex and complicated and difficult to conceptualize. And if you go to the next slide, um, it's very difficult to do it justice and, and draw it out because as soon as you draw it out, it doesn't quite make sense anymore. Um, we found that actually the personal, social and environmental interactions were situated in time and situated in place and were operating at different scales. So how to capture that sort of scalar, those scalar sort of interactions as well. In the next diagram, we try to, um, if you like, um, reframe it slightly and capture, how, see how we might capture this scale, you know, sort of scalar complexity and present it by these interlocking loops, which dissolve into sort of this nebulous interconnected space in the middle, which all co-constitute well-being experience. Um, in reality, the size of these sort of interlocking sort of loops sort of change with space and time. So for example, we found that the same person might go to the same green space on a different day, um, and while the personal dimension, the, uh, the, the, the spa uh, spatial dimension is the same, the same part, the same person, um, other things might influence that experience of the space. So the environment will be um, sort of impacted by the weather and the social will be impacted by the fact that different people on a different day or a different time uh, create a different atmosphere and therefore a different um, mood of um, interaction, et cetera. So people's um, experience change over time. And so this is really dynamic and constantly changing. Um, and the way, and the reason why we decided to present it in this way um, was really not to necessarily capture um, sort of um, and, and really define the relational well-being, but to really just try to um, highlight the fact that scales is important, especially as we start to come and think about how um, let's think about interventions and sort of the policy arena, so sort of kind of moving forward. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of flavor of, of why and how we designed the research. And um, as I said, we can talk um, a lot longer on the relational wellbeing framework, and there's a lot, a lot more to say and to unpack, but I will pass on to Lisa to elaborate on some of our findings. Thanks, Kay. So our research demonstrated that green spaces were used more widely and by um, a greater 
a range of different constituencies um, than prior to the pandemic. Both people re were reporting that they were going to green spaces that they hadn't visited before, even if they were in their local neighbourhood. And when we talked to friends groups, friends groups reported um, lots more volunteers from, from different parts of, of the local vicinity. We won't go through these slides in detail, but this is just to give you a sense of the different ways in which people talked about their experiences of well-being. Um, we categorized them drawing on um, the relational framework. So we sort of provided a, a typology of experience. And these, we could categorize them around safety, um, temporality and, and scenery and, and being in, in place. Um, we also developed a typology for thinking about how people derived and, and made um, and connected to their well-being around peace and tranquility, um, social connections and connecting to place. That was actually um, surprising and, and really important to us. And we looked at the, the contextual characteristics and the sensory properties and the symbolic associations. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of research showing that there's a relationship between well-being and, and green space use and access, but little of this research has kind of unpacked the pathways. And that's what we try to do in our um, relational framework typology. So we've tried to pull out some of the key factors that people talked about. So um, these were related, and, and the factors that kind of mediated people's experience of uh, well-being were to do with the physical constraints of the topography, the, the perceptual qualities, its layout, the facilities, the weather, um, lighting conditions, um, signage, of course, was important for people um, living with um, visual impairments, for example. The social atmosphere was, was crucial too. Um, people talked a lot about antisocial behaviour, um, people talked about conflicts with other green space users, and those users themselves may not have been aware of the different conflicts, so there's lots of intersecting social dynamics at play. People talked about their own personal agency, um, their feelings of enhanced well-being or not were often connected to people's prior state of health or well-being, their life stage, um, and their, their own circumstances. So one of the things that, that came out for us, as well as providing these important spaces for um, providing healthful things for us, green spaces are actually important social places too. And as well as providing restoration, reflection, and this kind of sensory stimulation, which um, abounds in the wellbeing literature, Green spaces served as important locations for social care, identity making and belonging. And these spaces were not only valued by respondents for their naturalness, but also for their fundamental social function. So our work emphasised how social connections and interactions were absolutely crucial to people's experience of well-being. Um, this is a, a little quote from one of our respondents. And the, the respondent says, it's an open space for the local community to come out and get some air. You've got older people that can come for a walk and you just, and, and you know, just socialise with people. It's important to have some green space because a lot of the surrounding areas don't have a garden. So it's good to have this park. So people talked about using it as a, as a way to connect. And during periods of lockdown, parks and other green spaces became really important community hubs or places, if you like that played an important role in supporting people and, and different groups with diverse needs. And there were um, activities that were put on for people, spaces were opened up, um, there were mental health services being um, utilized in green space community centers. And it was interesting for us that while pandemic media reports praise the rise of so-called community champions, the role of green space community groups in COVID responses was not widely acknowledged or celebrated. And we, and we found this quite perplexing, given that, given that going out in a green space was one of the few things that you could do. Another finding was the importance of green spaces as kind of hyper-local infrastructures of well-being. Um, so 
people that worked running green spaces, park managers, friends groups, volunteers, organisers, could liaise with people and, and open up spaces, open up parks and allow people to, to use, use their spaces. And one quote here says that we've had local families email and say, look, we really need a space for the children just to run around feeling cooped up. Do you mind if we use the reserve and we unlock it and let them in and say, you've got an hour. Um, it's also, we also found that green spaces played a wider role in, in placemaking um, through things like planting. And, and this um, respondent, she's a volunteer, I think, talks about planting in the green space um, in ways that's visible to the you know, wider community walking past uh, to create a kind of overall pleasurable experience. So um, friends, friends groups performed several crucial roles we found. They, these were informal, but they were crucial roles in um, fundraising, uh, green space maintenance, coordination of volunteer sessions, running activities and events, and liaising with local authorities and community groups. So they were kind of mediating um, social governance structures. Green spaces have long comprised public health infrastructure and offered pro proactive alternative interventions for health, but little credit is given to these important voluntary led organisations, we think. They often run with little or no funding. We found that um, these, these friends groups were particularly important in co constituting this hyper local infrastructure during the pandemic. And they did vital work to maintain and activate spaces through the events and organization activities that they put on. And when we asked them whether they did anything specific for, for well-being, um, they often didn't recognize that. But, but clearly, if you look at um, definitions of, of well-being, the things that they did were centrally about making people feel well and um, improving mental health. And we drew on and Kavada, who says that by strengthening the relationships of people living in geographical proximity, the problems of health, isolation, isolation, discrimination, unemployment and housing are no longer experienced as abstract societal issues, but as local um, realities affecting people you know personally. So it's perhaps this realization then that such hyper-local infrastructures for well-being are best placed to address issues like green space equity. And one of our study's key findings was the importance of these, these organizations, these friends groups, in, in the ways in which they mediated people's experience with well-being. Interviews revealed that the ways in which community groups directly or indirectly addressed equity issues of inclusive participation, democratic decision-making and redressing exclusions were often highlighted and the extent to which they were able to do this or even aware of the requirement and need to do this. Most groups talked about having increased numbers of volunteers or inquiries and perceived at least a greater diversity of participants. Many organizations acknowledge challenges in facilitating active participation from the wider community around the green spaces. For example, the majority of respondents noticed how with middle, white middle class women, um, often in older age groups, dominated committees or volunteer memberships. Some groups wanted to facilitate spaces or activities that catered to specific communities or um, constituencies. So uh, one organization ran um, sessions for women who'd experienced domestic violence. So the idea they say is that women will have a safe, safe space with no men in the environment, because obviously some of the trauma they may have experienced will be sex-based trauma. And they come with their children and they can enjoy the experience of growing, sharing, making things like herbal tea bags, and it's an opportunity to sit and talk in a safe space. So the interviews often pointed up the importance of creating a network of, of different kinds of spaces which address different socio-cultural socio needs. 
um, we interviewed one group that focused on growing black heritage foods, for example. And however, others worryingly saw the importance of producing environments that were, quote, fully inclusive. And they were blind to some of the ways in which it, this might be exclusionary. One, uh, one friend, friends group uh, organizer told us, there's no particular section of the community which feels they need a separate space. We don't encourage that. We just don't want to encourage that in any shape or form because the government is doing a lot for integration. And just because we have to adhere to certain communities, it brings about division and it just goes on increasing that gap and we don't want to be part of it. We want the park to be a big space, a big umbrella, so that everyone underneath it, uh, not just to have corners with different people. However, some respondents um, were concerned that this, this talk of inclusion smacked of either ticking boxes or more worryingly created environments where exclusions were less visible, but still very much palpable. So the friends group's mediating role was not always positive. One green space user reflected on, on the need to have open and difficult conversations based on her experiences of discrimination. Another repeated message from respondents was that people felt they needed to see themselves in community activities. Simply repeating that all were welcome was not enough. Some respondents talked about um, obvious um, manifestations of, of racism or, or threatening behaviour and the ways in which gendered sports um, made people feel unwelcome. Another interviewee talked about gentrification of the area and, and no longer fitting in. Respondents talked about how um, lockdown measures gave them renewed reason to visit and they saw perhaps a potential for creating a greater sense of belonging, but felt that it needed to be facilitated by wider social networks. Rishbeth defines and proposed the idea of curated sociability, approaches as possible frameworks for supporting more equitable participation and offering pathways to greater engagement. Our work clearly established the importance of having representative community organisers to, um, to help connect, change behaviour, address prejudice and better represent the wider community. So green spaces clearly have a clear and significant potential in facilitating inclusion and belonging. Just a few small conclusion points then. So green spaces we felt were crucial places of encounter that enabled urban dwellers to live and feel well, um, but this was a mediated and uneven experience. Well-being is, isn't just a, a static state, it's not either achieved or not, and it's not simply out there, neither is it simply in us either. It can't be separated, we think, from the embodied and situated contexts of people's lives and our biophysical surroundings and manifestations. It's something that's made and co-constituted by our socio-material interactions. So it's something that, that's activated and facilitated by the stuff around us and by the social networks too. And, and the two things are actually implicated and, and um, interact together. That's why I call them socio-material. So well-being's relational, it's mediated, it's processual, and it's experiential. And as a mediated experience, of course, not everyone will have access to the same socio-material conditions and resources to experience it in the same way. Therefore, well-being is always a matter of and for justice. What does this mean in practical terms? Well, Atkinson suggests that a relational approach can um, help us shift to um, away from how to enhance resources for well-being for individuals and towards attending to the socio-material and spatially situated relationships that facilitate and, and co-produce well-being. Drawing on Donati and Archer, um, this might require a focus on relational goods. So these are the resources that don't belong to individuals, a particular party, but belong to relationships. And we see the potential for friends' roles in playing this role. And they often do this, you know, without any resources. Um, it might be a way to augment some of these important relational goods. 
but great care must be taken that these groups are fully situated, representative of neighborhoods, knowledgeable about diverse needs and experiences of users, cognizant and reflexive about the more nuanced discriminations and injustice that can happen in these hyperlocal spaces. So while these kind of studies that show um, how the, the spatial proximity of a green space is important, there are lots more nuanced factors that we feel are important to pay attention to. We think that there needs to be a diversity of space and a diversity in space. And um, we, we think that it's really important to pay attention to these mediating factors. Our research points to the importance of facilitating a diversity of spaces to facilitate a diverse sense of belonging within and across different communities and ensuring that each hyperlocal space of governance encompasses a sense of openness, respect and under understanding to enable it to connect with the users and those um, outside of it too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, because we've got quite a few and limited time. So let's start with uh, a question from Luke Turner who asks, um, you talk of the benefits, but uh, are you considering the harmful activities that can uh, congregate and disturb the mental health of neighbours to open public green spaces such as loud uncontrolled music, barbecues, drug taking, and its debris, or conflict between different groups using the space? That's a really important question. Can I Kay, do you mind addressing that? Because I know it's something that you you were looking at specifically. I think you're muted. Sorry, Sorry I, I missed the first bit of the question. So, um, but, but caught the essence at the end. So sorry if I'm not answering it directly. Look about these different user conflicts and um, the fact that um, sort of, um, dog owners would use it in, in one way and would uh, not necessarily be considerate to other users. Um, Antisocial behaviour was, was a huge thing that people noticed and were concerning to them. So, so some respondents told us that they avoided the parks at certain times because that's when those types of activities um, congregated. Um, so even sort of some users and especially women felt that they didn't go at certain times, whereas if they, you know, they would go to the park during a certain time during the day, whereas that sort of quietness and tranquility that they were searching for, for their mental well-being, actually then turned to eeriness and um, feelings of, of, of unsafety. Um, so so those, those types of things did very much feature in the, in the reasons why people told us um, they either didn't visit at certain times or they avoided a certain park or that they it's it, it, while, while they while they did go they went with others or you know and, and sort of issues like that thank you um i did leave um there's um a question from carolyn moore that asks uh did you uh, did uh, Qatari's three ecologies influence the relational well-being framework? Did did what? Sorry, I don't know if it's me, but you're breaking up. No, sorry, I did I did get kicked out. Um, but it's a question on the three ecologies. Whether that um, influenced the relational um, framework? I'll just drop a link into that to that in the chat. Um, and I will, in the meantime, quickly rush to another question that I thought was quite interesting that we got from, from Twitter. Um, so Carol Marks asked, um, and she wasn't able to join, whether uh, you have any thoughts on the Parks for Health framework. Uh, yes, Parks for Health is um, Camden and Islington Parks for Health framework. 
Yeah, I'm actually involved in working with Camden and Islington on a dimension of that with another couple of projects actually. And so it's really, it's been really interesting to do some of this qualitative research that um, has helped to inform um, our discussions with Camden and Islington on that framework and, and some of the work that I've been involved with, with other um, colleagues in the Bartlett actually, uh, Gemma Moore and Ruth Hines, as we've been trying to develop a framework for park managers to um, help them better understand how, how their green spaces and parks can promote health. And we wanted to make issues of injustice and inequality um, central to that framework. So we're, we're currently um, working on that right now. The three ecologies um, notion uh, by Guattari, um, not directly is the short answer, but um, Guattari's assemblage thinking is, is central to our notion of socio-materiality. And we want to move beyond notions of re relationality, which are purely social, and sort of bring in material elements to it as well. So yeah, we're absolutely drawing on, on those kinds of, that kind of thinking. Thank you. Uh, I quickly jump to a question from Samantha that asks, have you looked at the well-being impact of the loss of informal green spaces? Of, of the loss of it or the... Sorry. Yes, correct. That's how it's worded. No, we haven't. It's a really, it's a, I mean, Kay uh, works on green spaces as a practitioner, um, as, as well as working on this project with me. So perhaps you'd like to, to answer this one. Uh, of course, we didn't ask that as a direct research question, but it came up during our, our interviews. Um, there were a lot of users, sorry, a number of users that we spoke to, spoke to who obviously were using their green spaces outside their estates. So they were in flats and the green spaces around it forming very important um, green space function for them. And, and, and very much saw those as their park. Um, and at the same time as, as some people were enjoying those um, incidental and informal green spaces, um, in nearby estates, those spaces were being lost and there was a lot on, on Twitter about that, that loss. And people who were interviewed reflected on that and actually reflected on the fact that um, all green spaces were important to them. We also found that people use different green spaces for different reasons, um, depending on their mood or the day. So um, we, we can't just think of these incidental green spaces as, as that incidental and informal and not necessary. They actually do perform a role in themselves. And, and, and yes, there is sort of that you know, connection with, people do have a connection to them and they are important for wellbeing. Okay, um, I'll ask one more question. Apologies to everyone who submitted such thoughtful uh, questions. But the question is, do you think that uh, urban, open or green landscapes interact with housing for well-being in terms of future urban planning in and around uh, the city? I think it's absolutely central to, to planning, um, given the importance of green spaces for overall health, but also other co-benefits um, to do with climate change mitigation and adaptation, you know, green spaces as, as floodplains and green spaces of areas of cooling. We know that urban heating uh, will cause a great number of, of deaths. So th these spaces are central, they're crucial, they need to be valued and protected and um, they need to be absolutely central to, to planning in, in every way. I, I'm not a planner, I'm a geographer, but I know it's something that, that Kay thinks about and works on in her day job. I mean, I may add to that is that we can't just um, look at parks and green spaces as isolated islands. Um, we need to think about a connected green space. So um, very much, and especially during the pandemic, people were going to green spaces and that walk walking experience to and from different parks and to and from different green spaces was just as important as the green space itself. So very much the urban realm and the public realm around these green spaces and the housing estates um, 
needs to be sort of greened up and and the way we we design them very much is important and has to be in sort of very much part of the thinking of how we design um, our living environment. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I am going to have to all wrap up, um, but I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And a big thanks to the both of you for sharing your research and your insights with us. Um, I will also just add that Inclusive Spaces uh, will be back on Wednesday, the 8th of June, with Queering Public Space, um, a UCL collaboration with Arab and the University of Westminster, uh, where we will explore the relationship between queer communities and public space. Uh, sign up details have just been posted in the chat. And so we do hope to see you there. Um, all that leaves me to say is, again, thank you very much to our speakers um, and look out for the recording, which um, should be live already on YouTube. So um, goodbye to everyone and have a lovely afternoon. Bye. Thanks so much.